9.05 a.m. I'm going to call this meeting to order. I'm going to begin by introducing um, board members and staff. To my left is board member D.D. Diadamo, and to my right is board member Stephen Moore. I'm Felicia Marcus. Uh, Mr. Howard, will you introduce the staff? Yes, assisting the board today are Janine Townsend and Courtney Davis. To my right, Chief Deputies John Bishop and Karen Turgovich, and to my left, Michael Lawford, Chief Counsel. Thank you. Um, emergency evacuation for anyone who doesn't know it, look for the exit. If you hear a noise that sounds like an emergency sound, pack up your stuff, take your friends. Uh, we meet in Cesar Chavez Park. Um, if you stay there, you'll know when we come back. Um, but obviously, you're free to go wherever you want. Um, uh, the meeting is being webcast and recorded, so please take your cell phones and other beeping devices and turn them on silent or turn them off. And then, and I'm a very bad role model for this, um, the microphones are very important for people who are listening over the webcast and they're very sensitive, or they're not very sensitive, so you have to speak very close to them. So my colleagues will remind me if I move away and when you come up uh, to the speaker, slot, just remember to turn the button on, the light will be green, and uh, get closer to it than you ever really wanted to, and it'll work. Great. So we are starting with Sustained Superior Accomplishment Awards. Terrific. Thank you. Chris. To my left, Board Member Fran Spivey Weber, Vice Chair. How about on? Okay. All right, good. I'm usually loud enough for the mics to pick up no matter where I'm standing, but I'll speak into the mic for the chair's direction. Um, good morning, uh, Chair Marcus, honorable board members. My name is Chris Kerrigan. I'm the director of the State Board's Office of Enforcement. Uh, today I'm proud to present Sustained Superior Accomplishment Award uh, to the team of special investigators and uh, legal support uh, that prosecuted a particular administrative civil liability action, Dr. Matt Buflabin, who's the director of the, uh, or he is the, uh, the supervisor of my special investigations unit, Ms. Julie Macedo, senior legal counsel in the Office of Enforcement, uh, Jim Fisher, uh, water resources control engineer and one of our uh, um, special investigators, and Mr. Leo Sarmiento, also a water resources control engineer uh, and one of our special investigators, and uh, to Ms. Katie DeSimone, who cannot be here today. She is a, a uh, water resources control engineer uh, from the Central Coast Regional Water Board. And part of the reason I'm so proud to present this award to this group is the way that they work together, uh, regional and state board staff, to complete one of the most complex investigations and administrative uh, enforcement proceedings uh, that we've had in the, in the last few years here at the water boards. Um, the uh, accomplishment of self uh, acknowledges the sustained and extraordinary two-year effort taken to investigate and prosecute the discharger's significant water quality violations. The, the uh, team spent countless hours analyzing the discharger's technical reports, inspecting the facility itself, interviewing residents affected by the violations, uh, oftentimes after hours when those residents were at home so that they could reach them, creating expert reports and preparing to give testimony and be cross-examined under oath at the proceeding. They, criti they critiqued expert reports and I mean expensive expert reports prepared by the discharger's consultants and created evidence to present in an adjudicatory proceeding. They prepared their own expert reports on the impacts of raw sewage spills to the Pacific Ocean and to sanitary sewer overflows in neighborhoods and on the attendant beneficial uses. Considerable technical analysis was required with respect to systems operations, and how the discharger systems were negligently maintained and operated, thus causing the spill, as well as in estimating the number of gallons spilled based on several different models. The scientific, legal, and technical expertise brought to bear by this group was unparalleled in a recent administrative enforcement proceeding. The proceedings itself was a 16-hour marathon evidentiary hearing before the Central Coast Board culminating in an order imposing a fine of over a million dollars. 
This was truly a Herculean effort by this team of state and regional board investigators. Uh, and I really do want to emphasize the level of teamwork was unparalleled with the regional boards in my experience here at the water boards. These investigators truly are special and deserve this recognition. Thank you. Sorry, we're all talking about how we want to be special investigators and special agents. <laughs> What a nice way to start the day. Thank you. Special agents, sewage, doesn't get any better than that for me. <laughs> All right, next uh, item on the agenda is the public forum section of the agenda where we hear from anyone from the public who wishes to speak not on an item on the agenda. And there's nobody here just to say howdy to us or anything. Oh my goodness, okay. Yeah. Well, ne next we'll move on to board business. Um, the first thing is considering the minutes from the October 8th board meeting. I'll entertain a motion. Second. Any all in favor? Aye. Okay. Minutes are adopted. Um, board reports. Board member reports. Anything to report? I'll start this way this time. Um, uh, not a whole lot. I uh, just wanted to report that the Central Coast Regional Board, who was partially honored today, uh, had their uh, annual offsite meeting this month and set some priorities and went over accomplishments in their region, uh, Region 3. Uh, a couple of priorities uh, moving forward this year, worth noting, are uh, implementing the low impact development post-construction stormwater management requirements, as we call them. Uh, but that is something that our, the state board is actively supporting statewide, and it's, and it's nice to see the Central Coast working in partnership with us on impact, low impact development. Um, also, uh, they've elevated the issue of preparing for climate change by promoting and assisting local entities with issues related to recycled water and water transfers. And uh, later in the year, in the March time frame, there's going to be a, a concerted effort to work with stakeholders to initiate development of long-term management strategy for the Salinas River channel maintenance, which has a lot of different aspects within our regulatory programs. So just a couple of highlights for, from Region 3 moving forward this year. Interesting. I was on a panel uh, last week. Uh, it was called the uh, Water Summit, and it was uh, it was it was special because it was an effort by local water agencies in the uh, Los Angeles region to um, bring in elected officials. There were 90 elected officials in the in the audience of about 200 people which is rare usually it's the same old same old <laughs> and this was uh, this was quite uh, quite good and and it's largely because elected officials are uh, are they they deal with many many things water being just one of those and so they're a little puzzled by what's going on so it was it was actually kind of it was fun to to talk with people and 
very impressed with so many young elected officials who are out there. And we really, I think, um, it's an area that where we should be uh, doing more as well. Uh, secondly, uh, the Water Quality Coordinating Committee, which is a committee of water uh, of uh, regional board members and uh, state board members uh, getting together once a year, uh, occurs this week, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And we will be focusing on um, climate issues and how those might be uh, addressed at the regional board and state board level and also disadvantaged communities and sovereign nations, how we can do a better job. Okay, well, first of all, um, I attended last week's uh, CAFO roundtable, and uh, this was a national roundtable um, put on by a number of partners, uh, US EPA. Unfortunately, they weren't able to attend. Sarah Bittleman was supposed to be coming out from US EPA, and she went, unfortunately wasn't able to join because of the uh, shutdown. Um, but there was good representation from other states. Uh, Aqua was involved, CDFA, of course, um, many of our regions. And uh, mostly what I got out of it was just the wide eyes from the representatives from the other states when they were hearing about our regulatory program and, of course, the size of our dairies. Uh, so they were, there were many states represented um, curious about our program, our successful program, and moving forward on uh, regulation. Um, so I found that quite interesting, uh, sat next to some folks from Midwestern states, of course, with uh, sm smaller operations, um, but uh, growing problems and a growing awareness. So it was great to see uh, California as a model. I know m many times we're concerned about these issues, but we don't take the time to uh, uh, sort of do a check-in and realize how far we've come. Um, and then um, I think the week before that, I attended a Region 6 uh, meeting in Barstow, and it uh, was a two-day meeting. Uh, went with uh, Gita Kapai and um, spent some time um, also touring Hinckley. So the day one of the meeting um, uh, was a real good opportunity for me, not knowing much about the background other than, of course, the movie. Um, uh, because there was a, a, a board update on the cleanup plan, um, status of the plume, and some requests coming from the community and PG&E to make some adjustments. Uh, Gita, uh, it's a good thing she was there because um, she actually is very well respected by the community, has spent a lot of time uh, with community members, and so normally when they have uh, these public meetings, they call upon Gita um, to sort of... Uh, uh, go out with the microphone and sort of mediate uh, because she's uh, very trusted as being um, um, unbiased. So uh, it was a lively meeting. Lots of folks from the community uh, were there to express their ongoing concerns. And of course, pg and um, gave an update and so did staff. And then the next day went on a tour and um, on advice of uh, council, uh, I, we did everything we could to avoid discussion of uh, the petitions that are pending. Great. Well, I think this is going to be clone Gita board report um, day. So uh, my, my two um, reports were both with Gita. Last week, Tam and I uh, went with Gita and John uh, and Sam Unger to an LA environmental justice convening on groundwater, which was a really interesting day where we were trying to focus on how could we look at the groundwater contamination differently um, not, not differently like it's a good thing, but <laughs> differently like how could we, what were the different ways in which we could um, deal with cleanup faster, thinking a little more creatively about our, um, our authorities, and we went with DTSC, and it was actually the whole process has been very good in terms of us sitting down with DTSC and figuring out how to use our respective tools um, in the most effective way. So, you know, watch this space. It was um, a very good meeting. Again, uh, EPA couldn't be there, and they are the 800-pound gorilla with uh, Superfund, so we're going to have to reconvene with them uh, being there. But it was a very, a very good meeting, and everybody did a, a great job, and I appreciate it. Uh, and then yesterday, Gita and I went to Lemoore and went to the Region 9 uh, annual tribal 
conference. Uh, if the government were closed, we were going to be given half a day, <laughs> pretty much, because the EPA folks couldn't be there. Um, and then it was unclear if we were going to have any time uh, if the government came back, but they did uh, find time on the agenda for us to talk with uh, the California tribes in the presence of the tribal reps in the presence of some of the Nevada and Arizona tribal reps who nonetheless asked questions, which was interesting, um, about our uh, thinking about uh, taking what the North Coast has done on cultural and subsistence beneficial uses and doing a resolution that would say those are official beneficial uses. We were going to do it quickly in response to the the state water tribal s summit that some of us, Queen uh, Tom uh, and I, uh, spent uh, a couple of days at a few months ago. Um, and then some of the tribes reminded us that consultation means consultation. And that means sitting there and working with tribes, not doing things for tribes. And so uh, we are going to do a series of meetings to actually ask them what they think we ought to do. And they've, uh, there's a tribal work group that's been created to help give us advice. But it was a nice opportunity to be able to do that and to celebrate the fact that the EPA folks were back. So um, Gita did a great job in, uh, in both settings. So we need, we need to expand that staff, I think. Because she can't be everywhere. She seems to be everywhere, but she can't be everywhere. Really nice job. All right, with that, let's move to item three. Mr. Howard, do you want to introduce it? Thank you. Um, before you is a proposed resolution to adopt the fiscal year 2014 intended use plan for the Clean Water State Revolving Fund Program. The intended use plan is an annual business plan for the Clean Water State Revolving Fund Program. And presenting is Christopher Stevens. Good morning, Chair Marcus and members of the board. Christopher Stevens, Supervising Engineer with the Division of Financial Assistance. I didn't have a pre presentation per se. I just did want to mention very quickly that the IUP was put out for public comment. Uh, the board did receive nine comments, and there's a summary of those comments as well as staff responses in your packet. Um, I'm more than happy to go over those. There, there was only one change that was made to the IUP uh, that was posted by the clerk, and that was there was a project that was misidentified as mm -hmm. being in Region 3. Other than that, there were no changes uh, from the, the, uh, the copy that was put out for public comment. So I, I guess I would just ask you if you had any questions, I'm more than happy to answer those. And if you want me to go over the comments, I'm more than happy to do that as well. Well, let's see. Do, do we, we don't appear to have any speaker cards for this, even though we had comments. So we've, we've read it. And if we don't have people in the audience who are here for the item, we probably don't need to go over the comments verbally, unless I'll defer to my colleagues. All right. Any questions, comments? Motions? So moved. With the except with the uh, correction for Region 3. Yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll second it, but uh, in my seconding, just really commend staff on an excellent effort. And, and just I, I see the, you know, the maturation of this program, and it's just running so well. And so much has been accomplished in the last few years. So second. Thank you. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Carries. Thank you. I mean, if there's anything else you'd like to share with us, your summer vacation, anything, we're happy to hear. Unlike the last two meetings, we're not going to be here till 7, so. All right. Item number four. Well, thank you, Karen. Yeah. Um. Item number four is an information item. It's our fifth annual update on efforts to, that we're uh, undertaking to assist small and disadvantaged communities in meeting their wastewater needs. Uh, presenting is Megan Tosney with the Division of Financial Assistance. Hi. Good morning, uh, Chair Marcus and members of the board. Uh, as he said, my name is Megan Tosney, Tosney, and I'm with the Division of Financial Assistance. In 2008, staff developed a small community wastewater strategy, and the strategy document is referenced in Board Resolution 2008-0048, which directed staff to implement various actions to assist small and or disadvantaged communities, or SDACs, and to report annually on our progress. This fifth annual update is provided as an informational item. A draft version of the item was discussed with 
various environmental justice, technical assistance, and industry organizations that work with SDACs during a meeting on August 29th. And feedback and comments from that meeting were considered in finalizing this item. The item is separated into two sections, Section A and Section B. Section A provides an overview of the various uh, recent actions benefiting SDACs, including uh, clean the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, or CWSRF, program improvements that were implemented per the May 2013 policy amendment, such as um, allowing for reimbursement of construction contingencies and various other things to streamline the program. Uh, our contract with California Rural Water Association, which provides wastewater-related technical assistance to small disadvantaged communities statewide. Revisions to the operator certification regulations, including allowing for provisional operators and for exemptions of certain class one wastewater treatment plants. Uh, the recently released fiscal year 2012-13 uh, wastewater user charge survey, which communities can use as a tool to compare their rates to others across the state, and the January 2013 recycled water policy amendment, which reduced the frequency of priority pollutant monitoring requirements, particularly for smaller facilities. Uh, then in section B, it discusses the following actions which are being considered for future implementation. So first, enhancing CWSRF program marketing and outreach. By June of 2014, we intend to develop a written plan to guide um, CWSRF program marketing and outreach efforts. We expect to make a draft of that plan available for input from SDAC stakeholders and um, to help ensure that their needs and ideas are addressed. Uh, the second is uh, financial incentives to encourage larger entity support. So we're working with one larger CWSRF borrower that has expressed interest in sponsoring an SDAC. We will work to develop a pilot proposal for state water board consideration during this fiscal year. Uh, the general concept is to have the larger entity provide technical support in exchange for financial incentives through the CWSRF program, such as reduced interest rates. Third, we have the general order for small wastewater treatment plants. Staff is working on a general order to streamline the permitting of small domestic wastewater systems that discharge to land, including individual residential systems. The proposed order would address systems with flow rates up to 100,000 gallons per day, and staff plans to include a model monitoring and reporting program. And then finally, evaluating opportunities for reducing the cost of compliance. This will primarily be addressed through the ongoing resource alignment project. Uh, changes and recommendations emerging from this effort that may specifically assist SDACs will be described in our next annual update. And no comments were received on this item, but I would be happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Just wondering about coordination with uh, rural development on um, funding or any other um, agency funding that might be available to disadvantaged communities. We coordinate with rural development um, on several projects. Um, they have a very limited grant cap on their uh, funding because they have even more limited grant money than we do. So it's very common that we'll supplement some of our grant funds with their grant funds and a combination even of their grant and our grant and loan funding and we always coordinate with them regularly to make that happen. Um, and we're also both involved in the CFCC, um, California Financing Coordinating Committee. So we see each other on a regular basis and there's good communication there. Thank you. Uh, the, I, I attended uh, the beginning of the last of the uh, California uh, Coordinating Committee, uh, California Finance Coordinating Committee meetings, and um, uh, they had, I, I, there were probably about 50, 60 people in the room, and they asked people to raise their hand as to whether or not this was the first time they had ever been to one of these. It's been going on for, what, eight years? Long time. About 90% of the room raised its hand. I mean, people in the room raise their hands. And uh, so, I mean, this is, this is uh, you know, a big need. And the kinds of groups that were there 
were all over the map. I mean, they were cities, they were counties, they were uh, nonprofits, they were uh, agencies, uh, water agencies. It was it was very impressive, and um, this is a, a very strong program that I think. Uh, um, you know, we, we may, you know, if you if you get a chance to go to one of their meetings, they have them every year. They go to about five places, and they've added at at a very special request from one of our regional boards. They've added a uh, always uh, a, a a drop in, uh, not always with the whole group, but with a substantial part of the group, a drop in in Los Angeles area, because. Um, most of their emphasis has in the past been fairly rural, but uh, realizing the huge need in urban areas of small dis of, of disadvantaged communities uh, is, uh, <clears throat> is something that they've taken on. And, and really it's our staff that's taken it on and others have, have joined around them. So thank you for doing that, that's, that's great. Yeah, I'm, I just uh, would like to highlight what I think is one of the most important issues in the state uh, and as well described in this report in terms of um, not only protecting water quality through our regulatory programs, but really recognizing um, the financial limitations of, of a big part of our state to a attain them without some assistance. And that's something the State Water Board can really um, step up at the plate and, and help provide leadership and guidance. And I think staff is doing a wonderful job in, in meeting that expectation, not just in s some of the recent accomplishments and what's proposed, but what I see here is a real concerted effort to integrate our, you know, in a, in a real time fashion, our policy development with implementation of these policies uh, in a way that helps translate. Um, success to small and disadvantaged communities in you know reaching uh, attainment of beneficial uses in their neighborhoods uh, and but also enhancing the, their local economy as water resource protection does in an in indirect way so uh, rather than come at them with with hard rules <laughs> that, um, and without any sort of assistance um, as had been done in the previous century um, today we're really, I think, coming at the two fronts of regulatory and financial assistance in an intelligent way. And in our policy development, we're anticipating how we can um, assist small and disadvantaged communities. So I, I, and I appreciate just some, some creative thinking that's going on in terms of this idea of marketing and outreach. Um, I've, I've actually, in my career, applied for CWSRF funding. And, and you're right, there, there, is a, there are a lot of common misconceptions out there about the process of getting loans or grants and that sort of thing. Um, I, I, you've done a good job of outlining in the report of some of the strategies. Um, what's some of your recent experience in marketing and outreach and what do you think have been some more uh, effective ways of doing that? You know, we talk about workshops here or there, training videos. You know, it sounds like an all-hands strategy, uh, but as Fran just pointed out, you know, there are certain forums maybe where we can be more effective, where people uh, who are in need of financial assistance can get the information, uh, not just in water resources, but other, other things in community development. And so could you expand a little more on some of your thoughts in the coming year on, on marketing and outreach for our financial assistance programs? Well. Um, to be honest, I think one of the best tools we have is our uh, technical assistance contract because that allows an individual person to go meet one-on-one -on -one with staff in the community and tell them about our program, what we have available, and how we can help them solve their issues. Um, so that's one. And we've only had that contract in place for about two years now, so I think that's been a great tool. And um, outside of that, our efforts are primarily through the CFCC funding fairs. Mm -hmm. We do presentations there and then in the afternoon we'll set up tables so that we can meet one-on-one -on -one and answer questions with folks that show up for the meetings. Um, I'm trying to think, and obviously, I mean, we go to conferences and things like that too, but I think being able to talk one-on-one -on -one with people is the best way to make it actually happen. Mm -hmm. 
No, I, I think that's a very good point. And I think the list of, of efforts is, is, has been helpful for me to understand, you know, really how effective this contract we have as far as at least getting out there and, and, and meeting with communities, like, as you say, one-on-one. It's a very impressive, diverse list of communities throughout the state. And then that translates to our previous item we just heard on the IUP, you know, in terms of what projects are populating our SRF uh, program. So I, I see the linkage here. I appreciate staff's efforts to make that linkage. And I think um, I'll just add in, I think one of the, the things as we look forward, um, we know that we will not be able to travel to every region doing um, the type of maybe one-to-one -one outreach we've done in the past, but we're trying to use technology a lot more. So we're looking at things like webinars, um, videos that we can post on the website where people can get training to how do I apply online, what is the process all about, and those are things really for all communities to use. However, part of this marketing plan is to see, throw some of those tools out, the web-based tools, and then survey folks and say, is this reaching the small communities? Is this technology in a way that the small communities can access it? So that's really kind of how we're looking, moving forward is technology. And, and that's substantive, you know, you, you're going to do the online application. I mean, that's a big step. And you just mentioned it. And, and yeah, that, that's, the, I remember the pile of paper I had to put together. <laughs> I got to just hit send. <laughs> it's real helpful. So I see that staff's really listening and improving the, pro the process um, uh, so that small and disadvantaged communities don't have a, a large quantum step to get in the door. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the great work and for the creativity and for the um, partnership and collegiality we'll have on the drinking water side in the months to come. So I think you get high marks um, for your work and hopefully working with your colleagues that will come over from public health department. Uh, both will soar to new heights. Thanks very much. Great. Mr. Howard, executive director's report. Yeah, I just wanted to say a few words about um, uh, the transition of the drinking water program over to the State Water Resources Control Board. Uh, yesterday I sent out an email to all staff uh, notifying folks that Liz Haven is going to continue in her role as the coordinator of that effort uh, and that that being a full-time job, she's going to stepped down from her position as Division Chief of the Division of Financial Assistance starting November 1st until uh, we expect the transition to occur July 1. Uh, in the meantime, her deputies will be taking the position for four months each, and so they'll have a chance to run the division, a little good experience for them. Uh, and it, recently, the, uh, we've formed two committees to help us uh, with this transition. One is an internal group, uh, and it includes quite a bit, few staff from uh, both our organization and from the drinking water program. Uh, we had a meeting. I must have been about 50, 60 people there. Uh, and they have formed a whole series of teams to uh, plan the transition of every element of the uh, program, IT systems, uh, budgets, human resources, plus the regulatory uh, aspects, and um, a lot of work going on there to get that plan put together by February 1st uh, that would uh, direct the transition. We've also got a uh, external stakeholder group to advise on that issue, and uh, they've had two meetings now. I attended the second meeting. Liz was at the first. They uh, discussed two issues at that meeting. The first was how should the regulatory program be uh, transitioned, the regulatory program from the drinking water program. And uh, the second was how should we be handling the MCL issues. Uh, there was some concern expressed by some, but generally I think there was consent with the approach the administration is proposing for both of uh, those questions. 
the first, uh, the transition of the regulatory program, is that we would largely continue with the existing system for the regulatory program, that is the permitting program for the drinking water uh, uh, facilities. We do that by having, by delegating permitting uh, probably to field offices or to uh, perhaps the new division chief. Uh, and um, also ensuring that we continue to have the field office presence that uh, there presently exists. Uh, that is having uh, folks that not bringing everyone into Sacramento, but continuing to have offices uh, scattered throughout the state. Um, uh, with respect to the MCL program, uh, we also there also seemed to be general agreement that we would continue with the regulatory process that presently exists for MCLs. The principal difference between the uh, way it's done at uh, the Department of Public Health and at the Water Board is that the Water Board itself would be now making the decisions regarding uh, what the MCL should be instead of the director of the Department of Public Health. So it would be handled at the board level uh, instead of at the individual director level. And uh, those were the two issues that we covered in the last meeting. Uh, going forward with these meetings, we intend to pick a couple of major issues for each one and then try to see whether or not we can get consensus or agreement in general with the group on uh, the various questions that are being posed. And so we'll be doing that for the next few months. And Liz will be uh, leading that. She was unable to attend the last one, so I took her place. But uh, I think that it should be her role to try to lead that stakeholder group. And that was all I wanted to say. Were there any questions from the board? I would just say, uh, just as a comment, having gone, I'm going to try and attend all of them, but I was on the phone for this one that um, Tom did a great job on it, giving people confidence, and um, I'm seeking to emulate his ability to use as few words as possible to make a point. It was very effective. Um, it was really good. And I, because I was on the East Coast, it was hard. I missed the MCL conversation, so I wanted to look at the notes when they were done. Um, so maybe uh, it might be good to share the notes with all the board members. I don't know if you've already been doing that, just so people can follow what the discussion was and what the issues are, since obviously it's going to be a tremendous priority and a big uh, workload change for the staff as well as the board in particular. So, yes. My only comment is um, kind of a heads up for the, uh, I know this was has been bubbling up and uh, it's not likely to abate uh, uh, over time, and that is the um, problems that some of the really small uh, uh, mutual uh, agencies have in terms of, of their drinking water quality and, and largely their safety issues associated with fire hydrants and things like that. And then, uh, it, at least in Southern California, there are at least two examples that I know of where larger entities are interested in um, in taking over these and it's it's mutually agreeable that they do so but there's some uh, issues associated with um, uh, with risk and 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 uh, liability mm -hmm. and so um, I expect that there'll be a lot more of this going on over the next 10 years so best we make sure and it's that's kind of separate but now that drinking water is part of, will, will be part of us it'll be this it'll be us and so we need to be anticipating that and and setting up someone to know what the what the rules of the road are for dealing with mutuals and and munis as well they, they are lightly regulated right now yeah the more you look at it the more you realize that uh, uh, consolidation is really the best way to go in many cases that there are these small systems that just don't have the capacity to deliver safe drinking water. And there, in many cases, there appear to be local entities that are capable and willing to take them on. It's just that there are ancillary costs that can't be passed on to the new ratepayers, to the old ratepayers of the uh, facility. And then, as well, there are uh, these enormous transition obstacles that was very eye-opening to talk with 
one of the people who was trying to actually bring one of these organizations in, and it was a hundred connections, and it looked like a Herculean task to get through all the obstacles to bring these hundred people into uh, this new system. So we need to think of ways to perhaps some legislation that would help to expedite that, since that would be the direction we want to be heading. Yeah, it's not a mirror image of the clean water structure. So it is it is very different. Isn't there of the schedule of items that we're talking about in the task force? Isn't isn't there one on regionalization and incentives for regionalization now? If I not, there I should be. I don't recall, yeah. But. Some there's some concerns from obviously the water agencies don't want to be directed to do consolidation. So the issue really is in incentives would probably get further faster. So, but you're right. Great. Any other questions on the, these reports? Are great. So don't take the fact that we don't ask you lots of questions as meaning we don't read them and use them. They're fantastic. Thanks to everybody who helps put them together. All right, we will uh, take a break now until 10 o'clock. The next item uh, was noticed not to start before 10 a.m. So we'll see you all back here at, let me just say 10.05. So I'm being realistic. 10.05.
Good morning. We're resuming and it is 10.06 on that clock. Um, and we are going to move to item number six. Thank you all. Do you want to introduce okay. it? Do you guys item want number six. Is item number six. Public hearing to consider adopting a proposed policy for maintaining in stream flows in Northern California coastal streams. And presenting this item is Katie Lee. And she'll introduce the other staff, which is Dana. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Marcus and members of the board. As Tom said, my name is Katie Lee. I'm a senior environmental scientist with the Division of Water Rights. With me is Dana Heinrich from the uh, Water Board's Office of Chief Counsel. I will be introducing agenda item number six, the public hearing to consider adoption of the policy for maintaining in-stream flows in Northern California coastal streams. I have a series of slides that will cover policy background and content, as well as the, a description of the development steps leading up to today's hearing. The State Water Board is required to adopt principles and guidelines maintain for maintaining in-stream flows for the purposes of water rights administration pursuant to Water Code Section 1259.4. In order to meet this requirement, staff developed the policy for maintaining in-stream flows in Northern California coastal streams. The purpose of the policy is to preserve in-stream flows needed for fishery resources while minimizing the water supply impacts to other beneficial uses, including agricultural, municipal, domestic, and industrial uses. The policy, will, the policy will apply to water right applications, small domestic use and small irrigation use, and livestock stock pond registrations, and water right petitions. The geographic scope of the policy encompasses coastal streams from the Matol River to San Francisco, and coastal mm -hmm. streams entering northern San Pablo Bay, and extends to five counties, Marin, Sonoma, and portions of Napa, Mendocino, and Humboldt counties. The policy contains principles and guidelines, the protective principles limit the season of diversion to time periods when flows are naturally high, establish minimum bypass flows greater than flows needed for fish spawning, passage, and rearing, and limit the maximum cumulative rate of diversion in a watershed such that diversion rates do not adversely affect the natural flow, of it, flow variability. Applicants may implement the policy principles 